This is Chad here from grayscalegorilla.com where we bring you the tools, training, and tutorials you need to make yourself a better motion designer. Today's video, I'm gonna talk all about AOVs and that stands for arbitrary output variable. It's kind of a fancy word for pass. I'm gonna show you how I use them in Redshift to save me a ton of time. So let's jump in. All right, so uh, before we jump in, let's talk about AOVs. That stands, like I said, for arbitrary output variable. It's a fancy word for pass. Now, uh, a lot of people, they think that, oh, you know, passes are something that I need to set up through takes or I need to set something up through uh, multiple scene files. Well, no, actually, AOVs happen at render time. They can happen as separate output files, like separate renders, or they can be embedded in an EXR, which is 10, that's how I use them. So uh, that's what we're gonna talk about here today. And specifically, we're gonna talk about how these AOVs can be used to save time in your comp. And uh, I think it's better to just show you rather than tell you. And we're gonna do something a little bit different in this, in this particular tutorial in that we are not going to start out in cinema. We are actually going to start out in, whoa, not that. We're gonna start out in Fusion. So Fusion is a node-based compositor, and there's a free version for those of you out there that want to try it. It's a node-based compositor uh, made by Blackmagic. And if anybody wants to be cool and post a link in the chat, that would be awesome. So what we are going to do, instead of showing you right away how to create them in Redshift, I'm going to show you how I like to use them and why they're important. Because I thought it was important to show exactly like how I use them before, uh, or sorry, I guess why I use them before I show you the how. So typically the way that I use them is uh, a couple different things. Like usually I'm sort of lazy and I'll render out a beauty pass and then a bunch of mat passes as my AOVs so that I can control the beauty in the comp. So in this particular render right here, which you, I, I put this up on Instagram, I think last week, uh, we've got an EXR rendered out of Redshift, and I'm just going to show you um, the beauty. So let's go ahead and throw a LUT on that. I'm not going to get into the to the hows of, uh, of of Fusion here, but just know that the co the core concepts that I'm showing you right now can be carried over into Nuke. They can be carried over into After Effects. It's all very straightforward kind of stuff. Okay, so here is the raw beauty pass out of Redshift. Okay. So the first thing I wanted to do, because I really don't do it this, this often, usually, like I said, I start with a beauty and a bunch of matte passes to manipulate the beauty. But in this particular demo, I wanted to show how to comp all of the different elements back down from AOVs into your beauty. So basically the idea of comping all of the different AOVs to get the same result as your beauty. And you're like, what, 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 how do you do that? Well, Redshift makes it very easy on their website, uh, actually in their, in their manual, they actually talk about the math that needs to be done to achieve the beauty using AOVs. So you, I don't know if this is really visible here, so I'll just kind of zoom in and, and kind of walk through it. So uh, a beauty pass to Redshift equals this, the diffuse filter multiplied on top of diffuse lighting raw added on the diffuse filter, diffuse filter multiplied on top of global illumination raw, uh, added to diffuse filter, subsurface scattering raw, and then spec, and then reflections, refractions. I'm not gonna go through all this. You can actually pull this off of their, off of their website. Uh, so I did exactly this. I built a comp that takes all of that math and puts it together. I split out all of my EXR, path, all my channels from my EXR, and I'll show you how to do that later if you want. I don't, like I said, I don't want to get too far into fusion here. So the first thing that I have, like I said, is my beauty filter, which as you can see, just has the, the actual color of the bot and it's got the sticker that I added and then it gets added or sorry, multiplied on top of the GI. Now the GI just looks like this, very grainy and noisy. There's not a lot of, I didn't really need a lot of passes in there. So, or I'm sorry, a lot of samples. So it's kind of grainy. So that get mul gets multiplied there. And then it gets actually uh, the GI raw filter gets multiplied on then any sort of subsurface that's going on, which I don't have. And then a spec 
and then reflections and then refractions and so on and so on. And I'll show you this cool stuff later. So why is it important to do this? Like, like I said before, you don't have to take all these different sub passes, diffuse filter, all this madness and put it back together in your comp. You totally can and it's, it's a valid workflow for a lot of different people, but I typically don't. I typically just do a beauty and then a bunch of mats. But like I said, I wanted to show you that it's possible. I wanted to show you how it was done so that you could, you could choose to go down that path later on if you want. Okay, cool. So now that we got that out of the way, what the hell is a custom AOV and why would I need one? Well, uh, a couple different reasons. Well, a lot of times you're gonna render something out and a client's gonna make a change and they're gonna say, hey, you know what? We like this render that you did, but uh, you know what? We, we don't like the color of that sticker. Or maybe we wish that the, uh, the edges, this metallic kind of edging th showing through, we wish it was a little bit brighter. So uh, typically, if you didn't have custom AOV set up to work like this, to give yourself this freedom in the comp, you would have to go back into your 3D scene, you'd have to set that all up as a separate take or maybe a, uh, a separate scene file, re-render it all out and then be able to give your client those changes. And that is a huge, huge pain in the ass. So I, I love to use custom AOVs to sort of act like insurance so that I'm setting myself up in the comp to be able to answer questions or be able to answer tweaks that come on later down the line. Okay. so. Here's, a, here's an example. You can see right here in this EXR, um, I made a couple of different custom AOVs. I made a pass for the label sticker. Actually, let's turn this on high quality so you can see it a little bit better. And let's go ahead and make this 100%. Okay. And so I also gave myself a mat for the center of the sticker where it's orange. I also gave myself a mat for the stripes. Now this is all coming out of one EXR. This is using custom AOVs, right? This is why I did this. So, and you can see I've had it hooked up to a color correct right now. So if I, if the client says, oh, you know what? We want that orange to, uh, we wanna shift it to a different color. Okay, well, no problem. I can just come in here because I rendered out that custom AOV. I can shift it to like a blue. And if I walk all the way down to the end of my comp, and because I applied it before I applied any of the lighting effects, it all shows up perfectly. Let me turn off the LUT there. So right now I have the ability to change the color of that sticker at any point in the comp so that, so that you know, you just have that freedom, that freedom to, to do it in the comp and not have to jump back into 3D. And that is the name of the game. Try to avoid re-renders, costly re-renders. Uh, so if we, like I said, we've got this stripes, we've got this pass, I'm going to show you how this was set up in Redshift in a minute. But let's say the client was like, yeah, we like the stripes, but they're too dark. I want to brighten them up. I want to see them a little bit more. That's okay. We have a mat for that. I'm going to just brighten those up a little bit. Let's walk to the end of our comp and look at the final output. And there it is. We brightened it up. Or inversely, if we wanted to darken them, those stripes, we could do that as well. Just bringing the gain down. Very simple and we'll bring the gain down and now they're much darker. So that is in a nutshell why I use them, to be able to affect things in the comp without having to go back into re-render. And you can get as, as crazy into the minutia as you want as far as what sort of custom AOV you want to build. So how crazy? Well, you can do an AO pass, which is what this is right here. Let me actually turn on the right LUT. Um, so you can do AO, that's a great way of, of making a, a custom AOV. You can see here, I've actually made a mat just for my edge wear on this particular shader. So if the client said, hey, you know what? I like this, but I want the metal to be brighter. All right, no problem. Let me just adjust that really quick. Let me turn that, pat, that, that on. So let's go ahead and make sure I've got the right one. And yep, okay, cool. So now you can see we've got, I can darken or brighten the edge wear if I want. So just that control, that control is what I'm talking about. And for those of you paying attention, uh, I've also got, I'm doing all my depth of field here with uh, the lens care depth of field, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Um, I chose to do it that way because it kind of helps me illustrate my point about AOVs. Now the depth AOV is gonna look weird to you because it's completely blown out, but trust me, the data is there. You can see, uh, well, it's kind of hard to see, but in my little overlay here, 
uh, I've got the values of that Z depth, or I can just clamp it right there and you can see that I've got depth there. All right, I'll walk you through that too. Uh, what am I doing on this one? I forgot what I was doing on here. Oh yeah, I'm just uh, merging the background on. And then I apply the 2.2 gamma and then a little bit of color correction, a little bit of sharpening. And that's how I end up where I'm at right here. So that is in a nutshell. Uh, I went really fast through that, but we'll come back to this in a minute. I just wanted to give you the why I use custom AOVs and then we can start to explore the how in Redshift. Okay, so <clears throat> all of this, by the way, um, is possible, like the splitting of EXRs. If you have questions about how I work in Fusion, hit me up after uh, during the Q&A at the end, and I can tell you all about how I split these out, if that's interesting to you, or sort of the scripts that I use in Fusion to make that happen. All right, so let's jump back into Cinema, and let's look at some actual Redshift here. Okay. So here is the scene that created the render that you saw. And I'm gonna fire up the IPR. Now the thing to remember when you're using AOVs in Redshift is you're gonna to wanna to be in bucket mode because they will not show up in the render view in uh, uh, progressive mode. So I can just tap over here to see all my channels. You can see I've got all the different AOVs that I'm spitting out. I've got my beauty, obviously. I got the AO going. I've got, I wonder if I can actually just arrow through these. Yes, I can. There's no caustics, but I rendered out the caustics just to make a very clean sort of, uh, like I said, I was using the AOVs to rebuild the beauty. So I made sure that I outputted everything that their, their formula wanted me to. Depth, like I said before, there's depth in there. You just can't really see it. The diffuse filter, diffuse lighting, edge wear, which is a custom AOV, which is the whole reason we're here. Emission, there's no emission. GI raw, there's no GI. I turned off GI for this. There wasn't really a need for it since I had a dome light doing all the dirty work. I got our mech logo mat, our mech logo uh, sticker, and then our mech logo uh, sticker stripes, and then object ID. Ooh, this is a really important one. I will hopefully get time. I'm going to make myself have time to get back to this because this is super fun. Okay, reflections, refractions, SSS, which we don't really have, um, specular, which we do have, and I believe. Yeah, that's it. Okay, cool. So that is all of our AOVs in a nutshell. How the heck did we make these? All right, so if we open up the render settings and we open up, uh, we go to the Redshift, we go to the AOV tab, you're going to notice that they've thank thankfully completely re revamped this entire workflow. Thank God. So before uh, I dive into that too heavily, I want to tell you how I output because that's that's kind of important for my workflow. I'm only rendering out... Uh, EXRs and all of my AOVs are multi-channel EXRs. They're embedded into my EXRs, right? So the way that I like to work is I don't even have this turned on usually. Let's just turn this on just for, for the sake of this demo. So I don't even have regular image turned on. I have multi-image turned on. And as far as my format settings go for EXR, I created a preset, which is basically zip and blocks of 16 scan lines, half float, 16-bit per channel, multi-file, all that jazz. Make sure you turn on alpha channel. I don't know why the hell it's up here. It's kind of stupid, kind of annoying. Sometimes I forget to turn that on. Anyway, um, so that is how I do it. And then if I jump back into the Redshift AOV tab, I don't really have to mess with anything then. And I'm going to create an AOV here in a second and show you what I mean by that. So um, you can see we've got all the AOVs that I've created. I can actually twirl down and see the different uh, settings for each one. I will give you this quick tip. If you're gonna do a depth pass out of Redshift to use with post depth of field, you wanna make sure that your, your filter type is gonna be, oh God, is this even the right one? Jeez, did, it, did I actually say, I, I'm pretty sure it's min depth. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure. And that's, the, that's gonna give you the best edges. The, most, um, the edges are gonna go just a little bit beyond the anti-aliasing to give you a really nice Z pass. Anyway, that's a different tutorial. Uh, so I will say that if you open up file output on here, um, you can see I've got multi-pass enabled, so I don't have to mess with any of this stuff. Now, if you're into saving out your, your passes as separate, as separate um, image sequences, great, go for it. It's really not how I like to work. I like to keep it clean, keep it all in one EXR, so I'm going to leave that where it's at. So where I'm spending most of my time with the custom AOVs in Redshift is going to be in the AOV Manager which is a really awesome little UI that they've created here for managing your AOVs. 
So you can see here, I've got them all listed. I can turn them on, I can turn them off. I can actually spit them out to separate files. In fact, you can, and you can actually access all of their different settings right here inside of this little, let me just make a little bit more space, inside of this little, this little uh, view space, a little view area. Uh, this is super fun and easy to use. And I gotta say that because um, before it was kind of a nightmare to add and subtract and deal with AOVs in general in Redshift. So um, let's go ahead and start with something simple. I'm a, we're gonna create a new AO pass. And uh, I don't typically do ambient occlusion passes because I'm generally rendering a lot of stuff with GI or dome lights or whatever. So I don't necessarily need them, but I understand that a lot of people need them. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just delete this pass and we're gonna cut it. Uh, like I said, I'm using this Wacom and it's super sensitive already. And I'm gonna delete this shader down here. Boom, gone. Okay, so we do not have any AO going on anymore. So how do we create an AO pass uh, or an AO, an AO AOV? That, that's gonna be tricky to say that uh, throughout this video. Uh, okay, so what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna go over to my little Redshift menus and I'm gonna select this, uh, the shaders and go down to utilities and choose AO, okay? So this is, what this is doing is it's, pre it's kind of creating this for you. Essentially just taking an AO texture and putting it out to a surface. One thing to note, you cannot publish a material out to a custom AOV. It will only accept color, integer, or float, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. You're not gonna output a completely different shader. It just doesn't, it, doesn't, it won't let you. Neither, neither does Arnold, so that's, that's a totally normal thing. Uh, so this is not a shader, this is just a map, it's just a texture, it's the AO texture going out to the surface. So it's all good, got our samples in here and whatnot. We'll just leave it all as default right now. All right, so we created that shader, but I don't see, uh, it's not gonna show up under, under um, my AOVs yet because we haven't actually created anything. We haven't created a custom AOV for that. So let's do that really quickly. I'm gonna open up my render settings, go under a AOV, grab my AOV manager, and I am going to create a new custom AOV, and I can do this a couple different ways. I can double click, and it'll just add it to my list. And I'm gonna rename this guy AO. I want it to be different than their AO, so I'm just gonna say mine, AO mine. And then all you need to do is select the little picker, or you can drag it, and select the AO utility shader that it created. And let's just go ahead and see if it showed up. And there it is, AO mine. And there we go. It's as easy as that. And now we have an AO pass. And so that is a really, really fast, quick and dirty little introduction to how they work. But let's go deeper. Let's say that we want to create a pass for the sticker. Okay, so I already showed you that sticker pass and I think it's this one, yep. So we've got the sticker pass. How did I create that? How, do, how did I make that? Well, let's, let's go ahead and make another one. So I'm going to just close those down. I'm gonna open up my, uh, my mech material which is gonna be right here. It's gonna be a little bit hard to see in this sort of tiny view. And again, the most frustrating thing about a Wacom pen is like trying to grab these edges I've found. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna like get too crazy into showing you how the shader works. Uh, it's just a simple sort of uh, wet, worn metal uh, shader and it's using the material blending. I've already done a few tutorials using this sort of technique before. So that is, um, that, that's kind of covered you know, in a previous, previous tutorial. But I am gonna show you that I have this sticker. Let's go ahead and locate this image and let's go ahead and look at it. And here is our sticker and it's a PNG. So this PNG has an alpha in it. So the first thing I like to do when I'm bringing in a PNG into Redshift and I'm gonna use it for any sort of comping is I throw it into an RS color splitter and I get the alpha out of it. So that is how um, I am actually able to layer this material doing sort of a, probably easier if I showed you in the beauty. And that is how I'm able to get the sticker to overlay on top of uh, my mech. And we have that, right? We have that texture, so why not use it? We have the alpha, let's use it to create a custom AOV because that's really what's important here. 
So if I come over here uh, to my find nodes and I type in AOV, you can see I, don't, I only have to start typing AO. And we have store color to AOV, store integer to AOV, store scalar to AOV. I doubt I'm gonna have time to get into the store integer, but the store integer is very powerful. Store color is probably what you'll use the most. So you can see I've already got one here sitting outside in, in, my, uh, in my shader. And let's just go ahead and I'll show you how that works. So you always want to put your store color, AOV or integer or whatever in between the shader that you're outputting and the actual surface output. That's where they go. And you can stack as many of them as you want. You can see here that you have the ability to put, I believe, I wanna say it's like eight. Yeah, you can put eight in here, but you can daisy chain these to create infinite amount if you want, it's up to you. So let's go ahead and do what I set out to do, which is we're gonna split out this pass and I'm gonna go ahead and view the output of this mat just so we can see it. And, uh, oh, actually, it, I think it came at the output of the R channel for some reason, that's weird. Um, I guess it just chooses the first channel, but we can just do this, yoink, and there we go. Okay, so now we're looking at the mat of that texture. So let's create a new AOV for that. Boom, I'm gonna go back to looking at the output of my store AOV. Uh, what do we need to do here? Well, it's pretty simple. We could split this out and just for, just for the hell of it, I'm gonna split this out to a new color splitter and I'm gonna use that same sticker texture to drive its input. And I'm gonna take this alpha out, which is just gonna be the alpha of this PNG. This is where it's gonna get tricky with the size. And I'm gonna say the out A, if I can grab it with a pen again, I am not a pen user. I'm gonna go over to the blue tab, which is gonna allow me to choose or add an existing channel. And I am going to choose AOV input four. And let's go ahead and select that. So um, I've actually put it in AOV input four. Uh, you can see it pops up down here. It knows that I've got something in there, but it does not know what I want to connect this to. It does not know where I want this to go. So in our case, we, are, we could add it to an existing AOV, but we're not. We're gonna actually create a new one. We're gonna add new custom, and I'm gonna name this one another sticker mask, and hit enter. Okay, so now if I over, go over here and I refresh my IPR, sometimes it's, it needs a little kick in the ass to, to work properly. And another thing that I wish I need to actually um, uh, tell them that this menu needs to like fly out more because I can't read any of my AOVs. All right, so here's my another uh, sticker mask and it's working, so it worked. So it's as easy as that. So once you start to kind of get your, your head wrapped around how it's working, it's really not that hard. And you can start to figure out different things that you might want to pass out to an AOV for comping. So in my case, I think what I did at one point is like I did the uh, the wear, I did the wear, the edge wear. I think my dog is trying to get out. My dog is stuck in my office. Give me one sec, I'm gonna let my dog out. Now well, that's the first, Cooper totally interrupting my stream. Uh, okay. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, uh, so let's, I did this edge wear, which let's go ahead and look at that. And that's really easy to do because I had already made a curvature map. I already made a curvature somewhere in here, if I can dig around and find it. Oh yeah, here it is. And it's going into a comp where I'm adding some noise so that it's not so perfect. And I'm actually, if you could see this noodle or line, whatever you want to call him, he stretches all the way out into input AOV input three. And that's where that's happening over there. So. That is actually just outputting this mask that I had already made for my edge wear. So let's make another one. Maybe let's do something with the scratches. Maybe I want a, I know I have some scratches in here somewhere. Let's see, nope, it's not that one. I believe it might be this one. Yes, okay, so we have, actually this might be a dust map. But let's go ahead and look at the output of that and go back into our beauty and if I can select beauty here. Okay, cool. So this is like a dust, it's like a dust map and it's being triplanar, triplanared in there so that it maps correctly. Uh, let's say for whatever reason, or do we want, let me see what this one is. This one might be more fun. Yeah, this is kind of like a pockmark scratchy texture. 
So let's say in the comp, we might want to control more of this uh, part of our render. Like maybe we want to bring the, uh, I don't know, the reflections down wherever it's scratchy or whatnot. So we're going to publish this out to a custom AOV. So we know that is right here and that's our triplanar. This is where it gets a little bit tricky because actually for the demo, I'm just going to move this over just so I can get there a little bit easier. All right, so with that triplanar, I'm going to actually just drag it into my store AOV and we're going to choose AOV input five. I'm going to select that store color to AOV and I'm going to give it a new custom AOV and we're going to call this dust scratch and hit enter. And let's go ahead and publish out the store AOV to our output and let's go ahead and see if it shows up dust scratch and there it is. So it's super easy and super powerful. So now when I render this out as an EXR, this is going to be stored as you see it right here so that it can be used as a mat to color correct the reflections or color correct the diffuse or however you want to use it. It's crazy, crazy, crazy powerful. And uh, I use them all the time, actually. Uh, let's go ahead and um, boo, boo, boo. Let's, let's jump in and see what else we can do. So the other interesting thing that you can do with these custom AOVs is that once they're created, and let's go ahead and shut this, because of the way that um, Redshift chose to do its AOVs in this fashion, you could actually save a render preset with a fixed amount and fixed kind of AOV. So if you like for me, like I created this AOV list here uh, to rebuild the beauty. So let's say that you wanted to do that every single time you rendered out of Redshift, you could create, you could save this as a render setting and all of these AOVs are gonna come through and you won't have to rebuild them every single time, which is nice. The other thing I think is, is worth noting is, um, I don't have it set up here, but usually I'll set up a output with a bunch of uh, tokens. And if you haven't watched my, my tutorial on how to use tokens, I think I covered it in either my takes tutorial or maybe it was, oh man, it could have been, uh, it could have been my uh, 3D workflow for 3D workflows for lazy people. Anyway, so being able to um, not have to render out my output and having everything just kind of built in along with having your AOVs set up uh, for you is a great thing to uh, do because it saves you a ton of time. Uh, what else is interesting? Oh, so another sort of AOV that, that you can do, um, I don't tend to do this a lot, but, uh, it can be extremely powerful. I promised that I was going to get back to this in a minute. Uh, and that is the object ID pass. So, um, the object ID pass is actually a, um, the object ID pass is unique in that uh, some people think of it as a clown pass, which it sometimes is known as because it gives every object a very unique and funky color and sort of looks like a clown car or something. But um, it, it actually, the way that I'm going to show you how to use it in Redshift, it's an integer pass. Now, the way that works is it's going to give every object's ID as an integer value in the alpha or in its pass, in its AOV. So what the hell am I talking about? Okay, so here is a list of all of, let's go ahead and turn off the IPR, we don't need that. So we have all the pieces of this mech, and by the way, this mech you can get on TurboSquid, I'll throw a link in the, sh in the, in the show notes um, so that you can check it out. Uh, it's an awesome model, it's a lot of fun to play with. Anyway, so you can see I, sh I have Redshift tags on everything here. So the way that I'm doing my object ID pass is I'm throwing a, a Redshift tag on it. If you go over to object ID, you can plug in a number. Well, um, I hope Merck is Merck Bilson is in in the chat because he is a brilliant dude and a red, fellow Redshift user. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I want to be able to like, you know, assign object ID numbers to everything in the scene and have them be sequential because that's the only way I'm gonna get a, a valuable object ID pass out of this. And he's like, duh, just make a bunch of uh, Redshift tags and do this, which I'll show you in a second. Let me just delete, let me delete all these tags. And let me just start at the bottom. Uh, come on, dude, this pen, this pen's killing me already. And I'm gonna delete all these tags. And I didn't mean to actually delete these guys though. I'm actually just gonna do this. Delete those tags, 
delete these tags and even even that tag. And uh, this one I'm gonna I'm gonna keep separate. Actually, you know what? For this demo, I really don't care. I've already rented it out. It's no big deal. All right, so I'm gonna grab all these guys. I'm gonna select them all. Go to tags. Go to Redshift. Grab a Redshift object tag. Okay, so now we've got object ID. I can turn this on. And Merck was like, dude, just type in num and uh, plus one. And that's going to sequentially number everything for you automatically without having to do it. So you can see the first one's got one. This one's got two, three, four, five, six. And I was like, dude, I love you, man. You're a genius. So uh, once you've done that, you're kind of like, okay, well, um, what does this mean? Why is this important? Why do I need to know how to do this? Well, because it's really awesomely cool. Let's go ahead and turn on our IPR again. And we're going to find that object ID pass, which I believe is right here. And you're going to look at it and you're going to be like, this makes no sense, dude. It's all white. I don't, I don't understand why. This doesn't look like a clown pass. It's nothing I can pull a key on. What is this thing? Well, if you render this out and you give everything a unique object ID and you render it out, you know, floating point or EXR, like I was just showing you, multi-channel, and you bring it into a comper, either Nuke, Fusion, maybe After Effects, I'm not sure, I'll have to look into that. But okay, so let's just go in here and I'm gonna show you that exact same pass in the comp. All right, so here's the object ID and it looks the same. You're like, wait, I don't get it. This isn't, this isn't what I thought it was gonna be. Well, if you notice, as I'm mousing over every object, it actually has a completely unique RGB value, okay? So in this case, I'm boolean, I'm channel boolean, booleaning, boy, that's a tough word to say, booleaning this into my comp so that Fusion knows, and if you look right here, it says object ID. Fusion knows what an object ID pass is. In fact, I shuffled it, if you look here, I'm not gonna get too far into this, like I said, this isn't a Fusion demo. I can shuffle, that information into my object ID channel so that Fusion understands that this has object IDs, an integer value. Each object has a unique number, all corresponding back to that tag and the number that I was giving it. So if I mouse over this canister, it says 106. If I mouse over this piece, it says 130, and you can see that number changes, okay? So let's go ahead and turn on those LUTs so a little easier to see. So why is this important? Well, because Instead of having to render out a puzzle mat for every single object, which can get really tedious, and sometimes you just need to create a little bit of a color grade and you're not doing anything too crazy, then this can work for you. And how does it work? Well, in our case, in our case, we're using um, uh, uh, Fusion, but you could do this. I, th I want to say it's relatively simple to do this with Nuke, and it's, I think it's even... It's a little bit more difficult to do with, with After Effects, but I think it can be done. So let's grab a color correction node and let's just plop it into our tree here. Let's look at it. And let's say that we want to shift the color of one of these metal parts to be blue, right? So if I just grab the blue and maybe the gain comes up a little bit. So right now I just shifted everything to blue, but really we just want this one canister to go to blue. Well, because we've got the object IDs working properly, and this is not like anybody in the chat saying, oh, is this deep, is this deep EXR, like deep compositing? Not really. It's, um, it's not quite shallow and it's not quite deep. It's like sits somewhere in between, really. Anyway, so uh, here we go. We got our color correction. We want to affect just this canister part of the mech right here. Easy to do if you've set up object IDs correctly. I'm going to jump into my little... Um, uh, utility part of the node here, my color correction. I'm gonna turn on use object and check this out. I'm just gonna hold down pick and I'm gonna drag whatever object it is that I want this color correction applied to. Because I have all the IDs built correctly, I can even do individual slats. It's kind of hard to see at home. I'm sure I should probably skew this a little bit brighter so you can see it. Let's go ahead and select the canister like we wanted. Go back into the color grade. I'm gonna boost the intensity of this gain, maybe even uh, boost the saturation for comedic effect, but at least you can see it. So uh, again, jumping back into that color correction, gonna select a different object so you can see this a little bit better. So all of this is happening before the depth of field and, and whatnot so that it comes out all pretty. Let's go ahead and turn off the LUT and there we go. So this is why object IDs are super powerful. If I had done like the typical sort of clown pass, I would have had to pull a key on these individual 
crazy colors. Uh, but this is a lot easier. Now this isn't super clean. Like if you notice that this is a this is a channel uh, pass, so it's not going to have any anti-aliasing. So you will get cleaner edges off of something like a puzzle mat or a typical sort of clown pass with a an object ID clown pass. But for most situations, if you're just tweaking it a little bit, you're not going too crazy. This can be just fine. In fact, if you're doing it just to do a little slight color grade, it's totally fine. Um, so uh, I hope I hope that made sense. Um, I feel like I'm I'm uh, I feel like I covered quite a bit. I feel like I I could do an entire uh, another entire tutorial just on the um, the integer part of of AOVs. And actually, there's already quite a few videos out there that people have created um, that kind of showcase how you can, you can use user data to drive a custom AOV. Um, if you guys tell me that you want to see more of that, uh, I'm going to jump into the chat here in a second. If you tell me that you'd like to see that, maybe we can, if everybody agrees, we want to hang out uh, and, sh and see more of that. I'll try to on the fly whip something up. Or if you have a question about any of this crazy stuff I just laid out, uh, uh, hit me in the, uh, in the chat. For those of you watching um, after the fact, thank you for tuning in and uh, I'll see you on the next stream. All right, so I'm sitting here in the chat, ready to answer questions about custom AOVs. Um, Mess, hey buddy, what's up? Haven't seen you in a while. Happy New Year. Sorry about my, um, <laughs> my dog totally interrupting me. I was really trying to keep this tight and it's so much to cover. And if you guys want, I can dive back in and, and show you the integer uh, stuff or ways of using um, uh, user data to generate AOVs. Um, so yeah, Carlo, what's up buddy? Thanks man. Grant, good to see you. Happy new year. Um, uh, Kaiku, yeah, we just, we, we, we just wrapped it up. I'm trying to keep these sort of around 30 to 40 minutes, but it'll be up on YouTube as soon as it gets edited. However, if there is um, things that you want me to show or you want me to dive into uh, a deeper sort of dive, I'm able to do that right now. I'm actually free for another, however you guys want, how long, however you guys want to, how long you want to stay, completely up to you. I'm here for you. Um, okay, so Image Lab wants to know, why are there store integer and store scalar to AOV when the custom AOVs are limited to RGBA only? Uh, so the store integer, and I'm not really, I can't really speak to the store scalar. I haven't come across a situation where I would need that, but the store integer is really great if you wanted to, let's say, build your own object ID path, similar to how I just did. So if you had a very specific integer value that you wanted to assign to an object uh, through a pass, that is, or th sorry, through an AOV, that's how you would use that. So that's kind of um, for doing that. Uh, Hadi wants to know, um, any advice to reduce artifacts for depth? Yes, so um, as you may have noticed, I was using post depth of field, lens care. You wanna make sure that you're using, uh, I'm gonna jump back into the screen cap, and you're gonna wanna make sure that you're rendering out your AOV for uh, your depth out of Redshift using, do, 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 where is it at here? I'm just going to the manager. Um, I believe I'm using min depth. Uh, this may not de default to that. I think it might actually default to full or something. I can't remember. Um, but if you notice, uh, I think I have a tutorial about this. A Z pass requires extra pixels along the edge to cover for anti-aliasing. And you actually don't want any anti-aliasing on your Z pass to get a proper uh, depth of field going using something like lens care. So min depth, I believe, is what I used, and I'm pretty sure that's right. But if it's not, I'll try to update update the uh, post with the correct setting. Um, and yeah, then uh, I use uh, lens care. It's a fresh lift. Man, I butcher that name every single damn time. Uh, but yeah, I use that to do my depth of field. In fact, I can just like dive in here and kind of show you how that's working. So here's my depth of field. Let's go ahead and turn on my LUT so that I can work in 2.2. Um, let's go ahead and also 
look at the Z here. So this is what Frillshift sees as my depth. Um, I have to invert the depth here because uh, Redshift sees the depth as white being far away and black being close to camera. So you invert it, you do an auto range, and then you come in here and you can say sharp zone and you can like sort of pick where you want your depth to be on your shot. In my case, I chose just where that sticker was. That's really sensitive. So like somewhere in there, then go back to normal blur. And then if you look, you can actually say, oh, I wanna look at the iris. So this is the actual bokeh or bokeh, whatever camp you fall into. And I've got it rounded a little bit. I got six facets, a little bit of a uh, of an anamorphic squeeze on it to make it look a little bit more realistic. And that's kind of makes it look nicer on these areas down here. So that's uh, that's how I do uh, that's how I do it. Um, so yeah, I'm going back to the chat. And let's see, is that working? Yeah, okay. Um, mm -mm. Cinema 4D Tutorials SV wants to know, is it possible to get a link of your metal material? Uh, I am actually currently working on a entire material pack that will be for sale at some point for Grayscale Gorilla. And I imagine there'll be several flavors of it in that, but I do not have a timeline for that yet. I'm in the chat. Uh, let's see. Min depth is the same as min max effect in AE. Yeah, I believe the full shift uh, tool, the, the lens care depth of field is the same. Um, whether you're using it for nuke, fusion, or after effects, I believe it's the same. Uh, yeah, it's not, in my case, it's not auto mapping to. Um, because it's a it's a 16-bit half float, it's brighter than white. So, but it's smart enough to know that. So, if I I would usually usually click the auto range, and it like shoot, clamps it down. Uh, ben says render two million passes just to be safe, dude. Yes, I mean once you understand like how custom AOVs work and how they can save your your ass in post, you start to think of like all the different things that you might need, like maybe a Fresnel pass where you just take the output of a Fresnel. Uh, and keep in mind, they, these, they don't have to be connected to your shader. They could be something brought in completely separate. You could have a, a, a facing ratio or a Fresnel uh, texture going out to an AOV so that you could control um, some light wrap or some backlighting. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've been promising that pack forever. I know, dude, but it's I, it's so hard to find the time to actually like sit down and jump in. Uh, Brune wants to know, complete noob here, but what is Redshift used for? So Redshift is a third party. Well, it's a it's a it's a biased uh, renderer that's available for Maya, Houdini, 3ds Max, Cinema 4D. Uh, it's typically used to do photo real 3D renders. Very fast at it too. Um, do you always use Z depth instead of rendering in depth of field? Uh, no, I'd say it's about 50, 50. I'd say it depends on the scene. Um, so if the scene has, if I, let's just put it this way. If I can do it faked, I'll do it faked. If I can't, meaning that if there's glass or there's some sort of, uh, really tight shot with something that extreme foreground and like extreme sort of background then I'll do it in camera. But I usually try to do it in post because I just love to be able to control every little aspect of it and not be tied down. Uh, I want to be able to sort of get into that. Um, let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Complete noob here as well. Doesn't C40 have a, have a good multi-pass system? Um, it might. Um, I have only used third-party renderers. I'm fairly new to Cinema 4D, so I started off using Octane, then I moved to Arnold and picked up Redshift. So before that, I was using V-Ray and 3ds Max. So um, I, I believe you can build a beauty from all the different components using physical, totally possible. However, it does not have custom AOVs. So um, custom arbitrary output variables are definitely something that's more in the 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 newer sort of renderers that are coming out right now. Um, somebody wants to know, is Redshift faster than Octane? Uh, I'd say in some situations, yes, and some probably no. Uh, it really kind of depends on what you're doing. 
Oh, Philip wants to wants me to show the Fusion EXR shuffle. Okay, um, let's do that really quickly. I know a lot of people are like probably like I said, Fusion. There's a free version of Fusion that you can pick up. Uh, that I think its only limitation is that it's HD and you can't use any scripts. Um, but otherwise, it's completely functional. So uh, I'm back in Fusion here. So like I said, um, I bring in one EXR, and I'm just going to show you how I do that. And this is actually um, a script that a friend of mine wrote, Tim Little, and I'm going to put the link, link to it uh, after I finish the stream. So let's go ahead and import, um, let's import something. Let's just go up here to there. And I'm gonna grab this EXR and I don't even know what this EXR is. Oh, it's this one, okay, cool. So I'm gonna select that EXR, I'm gonna go to script and it's called HOS split EXR. And I'm gonna select it and I'm just gonna want a vertical placement of the EXRs, so I'm gonna hit okay and it's gonna take any channels that I already have embedded in this EXR and it's gonna split them out to their own loader. So that makes it a lot easier to deal with um, when you have as many custom AOVs as I have. It's easy to just like cut, split them all out and then start to spread them around where you need them or channel booleans them in where you need them. So if you, I believe if you Google Tim Little EXR host split EXR script, you might be able to find it. So I hope, I hope that's true. Anyway, uh, okay, uh, back in the chat. <laughs> um, Slabo saying, I think I'm saying that right. I keep having problems with foreground objects, edges, whenever I try to post up the field, even when using frill shift, or why is that? It's probably because your Z-pass uh, is, is not filtered properly. A Z-pass needs to be unfiltered and needs to go a little bit beyond the anti-aliasing edge. Uh, and I think I have a tutorial, I want to say I did a tutorial on Grayscale Gorilla about that. And it's, um, so that's probably the, the what's causing it. Uh, it also could be that you're trying to maybe push too much depth of field into a fake depth of field situation. And that can also fall apart because it's only, it, it can only take you so far. Um, mm -mm. All right, so back in the chat here, just a think. Oh, um, Arvind, thanks, I've never tried to multi-pass systems, always re-rendered stuff every time. Yeah, re-rendering uh, is bad. Um, I hate re-rendering unless I absolutely need to or unless I'm making something a lot, unless I'm fixing a problem or making something significantly better, I try to cover my ass with passes so that I can, and they're generally mats, like it's almost always I'm spitting out custom AOV mat passes. Uh, puzzle mats out of, uh, oh, I actually didn't show puzzle mats in Redshift. Uh, I should probably do that at some point. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely how I work. I usually do a beauty and then a ton of passes, mat passes to cover me for, for post. Yes, re-rendering can cost time and money. Uh, oh, oh. oh yeah, that's right. I did a, I did a, I did a tutorial about the Z pass coming out of physical and how it's wrong and like a, a cheat kind of way to get it right. But if you're using Redshift, Octane, Arnold, whatever, their Z passes are right. So you don't have to worry about that. And uh, maybe I should update that tutorial at some point and maybe cover different renderers and stuff. But yeah, for right now, I think it's good. Um, mm -mm. Redshift behaves kind of weird when I use alpha texture with volumetric lights, create shadows on texture borders. Yeah, I don't know about that one. I'd have to I'd have to dig deeper onto that one. It's not one that I would be able to just answer right off the bat. Uh, how does AOV render preset handle your custom linked AOVs if the material doesn't have the call up? I understand generic passes beauty. You are correct. It would not work because if the shader is not in your scene, then of course it's not going to be able to find it. So it's kind of like I would recommend just getting the generic stuff sort of out of the way um, if you wanted to do that. Uh, but yeah, um, or actually you could make a startup scene that had sort of the AO and all that stuff built in, but that's kind of a pain. I would probably just keep it basic and then do the basic stuff that doesn't require any mats and that, or mat, any sort of textures and then sort of go from there. 
Let's see. D D D. Uh, should I buy Ringer Engine? Try uh, or learn how to use standard physical. Uh, it's really up to you. I mean, uh, you could totally use physical. I still use physical, uh, not as much as I used to. Um, I sort of jumped right into third-party rendering when I got into cinema. It's it's not. I I mean, yeah, why not? You might as well know it. It's there. I think it's good to know as many render engines as you can. Uh, to make yourself a little bit more flexible and be able to tackle things that certain renderers just aren't good at certain tasks. So knowing more than one will just mean that you'll be able to do more. So I, it, sometimes I know it's hard with time and whatnot, but a lot of these renderers operate very in very similar ways. The AOV concept in Arnold is very similar to the AOV concept in Redshift. So once you kind of learn that part of it, it becomes much easier. Uh, yeah, so if there's anything you want me to show, um, let me know. Uh, I'm sitting here waiting for some, for some juicy questions. Otherwise, we'll, we'll wrap it up here pretty soon. But um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Chad, did you use a second copy of Color Splitter just for demo or for some other reason? No, just for demo. I, I totally could have pulled that alpha out of that same one, but... I didn't want, I just, I, I want everyone to, I, sometimes if I don't do it and go through the motion, um, or, you know, some people just don't realize that you can control, and I didn't even actually make that apparent, like when I'm uh, control clicking something, it's actually creating a duplicate. So sometimes I just do it out of muscle memory. So yeah, that was totally not needed. I could have pulled the alpha out of that one and went into the other ones. Um, uh, Ismail wants to know, is there a tool to convert Cinema 4D materials into Redshift materials? Uh, I believe Redshift will do a conversion on the fly, meaning that you could actually take a physical material and render it in Redshift, and it'll try its best to make it look similar. Um, I don't believe there's a script yet. I know Arnold has one that will convert things that you've made in physical to Arnold, but I'm not sure there, one, there exists one for, for Redshift. Uh, Tokyo wants to know, what can you do with your AOVs in comp when you build your beauty from scratch? I've never understood why that is useful. Is there any practical uses for that? Yes, there is. Glad you asked. Uh, that is a great question. Let's jump into, I'm going to jump back into my comper. Now this, like I said, you could do this in any comper. It does not have to be fusion. It can be nuke. It can be after effects. So why did I split this all up and rebuild the beauty uh, like we see right here. And like, let's actually jump out to this. And okay, cool. So this is the combination of all the diffuse filters on top of the GI, on top of all that stuff, that, that, that formula that I showed you earlier right here that is on Redshift's uh, manual. If you follow this formula in anything, even in, in Photoshop, you'll get the beauty. And why is that important? Well, like in this case, if I'm tweaking the, the, texture of this of the sticker i don't want to necessarily have that affect the reflection right that's happening on the metal because if i put this mat on a beauty and had it affect it way down here at the end of it i would be let's say if i wanted to let's just do something kind of crazy here so let's grab our sticker mat and we're gonna pump the gain of the sticker to make it really bright so if i did this later in the comp before the reflection was actually put on top, I would be blowing out the reflection as well as I'd be blowing out the sticker. Does that make sense? So it's a good idea to sort of build it this way. So I'm actually applying the, uh, the color correction to the sticker on just the diffuse, on only the diffuse of, of our render here. So you can see the reflection hasn't even been added nor has the GI, nor has the uh, any refraction that I might have, any of that stuff. So I'm actually able to affect my render in a more physically correct way because I can come down here to the very end of this comp. I mean, it's not, it's not a super great example because it is white, but this reflection here isn't blown out over that sticker because I applied that color correction before the reflection was even added. So I hope that makes sense. So that can be very useful if you're just looking to affect something that's in the reflection channel. So let's say we have our reflections here and these, uh, actually, you know what? I'm gonna do specular. I actually already had this demoed out. 
So we have our specular and we actually have the ability to now do a color grade on just the specular. So if we wanted to, let's say, I don't know, tint the reflection a little bit green here. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm passing through that. Am I passing through that? Let's see what's going on here. Spec should be actually, let's reset these color changes. Don't use object and let's make it, okay, here we go. Blue, green, right there. So now we're affecting just the reflection. It's not actually affecting the diffuse color. So you can always come back here and say, okay, this is the diffuse color, the GI, all that sort of thing. Now we have a blue reflection and it didn't, I didn't have to tint my entire image blue. So it's the ability of affecting just parts of the comp. That's what makes this workflow uh, nice. So be able to really kind of dissect it. Again, I don't really use it that often. To be honest, I, I'm kind of lazy. I'll do like a beauty and then I'll just do everything else with mats. So good question. Um, well, because the um, uh, Arvin wants to know, this reflection won't consider the color corrected sticker, does it? Well, uh, because it sort of does because the reflection is just a layer of specular on top of the sticker. So I wasn't, when I, when I shifted the hue of the sticker, I wasn't shifting the hue of the reflection of the sticker. I was just shifting the hue of the sticker. So um, as doing it this way, that's why this makes sense because you're actually just, you're adjusting the hue of the diffuse on that sticker, not the, not the reflection of the room or whatever on top of the sticker. Uh, very easy to do um, to affect the reflection color since we have this custom AOV, we could use that anywhere in the comp to tweak the color of the reflection just over the sticker. We could use it to do a number of different things. We could, we could use it to blur the reflection over the sticker if we wanted to. Um, obviously, you can only push that so far, but it is a totally viable workflow. Uh, Bogdan wants to know, is there any news on the GPU version of Arnold? Uh, no, no new news, no new news. Uh, but I'm hoping it's soon. I'm excited about that. I've been waiting for it for a long time and I'm really, really uh, looking forward to it. In fact, I need to do this video. I'm going to try to do a version for Arnold as well, because I think it's, it's kind of good to have both. Um, since the workflows are very similar, I'll probably use a very similar scene. I'll probably use this scene, uh, and try to come out with that in the next month or so. Uh, is there a way to toggle through the object ID mats to visualize each individual component in Fusion, or do you only use object selection? So, uh, yeah, the way that I was doing it earlier, let's just jump in here. Let's just find that object ID where I was shuffling that in. Uh, I still use terms sometimes. I, I still use new terms sometimes, but channel boolean zing is what it's called here. Oh, my camera timed out. Here we go. Um, okay, so let's find that. Where is it at? Uh, I thought it was down here. AOV. Oh, here it is, object ID. I even labeled it and I didn't even read my own labels. So um, I don't know if it's coming through, but right here, Fusion has a little menu and that you get that just by coming over to this little uh, sub view menu and you can go to color inspector and just turn this on. And now whatever I'm mousing over, it gives me the ID number of that object. So that is object 106. This is object 195, 183, and so on and so on. So that's usually how I do it. <clears throat> what do I know about AI, the AI denoising and redshift? Uh, I know that it is based on the AI NVIDIA denoiser, I believe. And I haven't played with it. Um, I, I, I don't know how I feel about it because I mean, obviously denoising is cool, but I've never really had a problem with noise in Redshift. So I'm a little bit like, I'm not sure if I would use it. I mean, I guess if I had a noisy render, I might, I would use it. But once you kind of understand how Redshift works, it's pretty noise free. Uh, especially once you dial the settings in, it can be pretty, pretty noise free. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's great that it's there. If, if it, if it works awesome. 
It's only going to be for the IPR, though. That's kind of a bummer. But, I mean, it's useful. Uh, okay, cool, guys. So, looks like we're coming up on an hour here, which is about where I wanted to be. Uh, any other questions that I can answer in the next three minutes? Hit me, and I will do my best. Again, thanks for showing up. Thanks for hanging out. It was, it's fun. Um, always make sure you check grayscalegorilla.com slash live for our latest schedule and whatnot. Uh, Crossfader, is that you, Lucas? Uh, he wants to know, what's the current limitations of RS, of Redshift? Um, wow, uh, that is, I guess, completely completely dependent on the use uh there are things that that it doesn't have that i wish it had um i wish i could just quickly create an object mask very easily with a tag the way that i can in arnold um sometimes i feel like the sss the subsurface scattering in redshift is not very good uh it can be buggy um Sometimes the IPR does weird things that you have to restart it. Um, just small, annoying things like that. Sometimes the GI can look a little bit um, almost sort of approximated and not as real as like Octane or Arnold. Uh, but, you know, I'd say it's, it's, it's great for what it is. It's super fast. Um, mm -mm. When will I be making a class for Learn Squared? Oh man, I would. Those guys are so good. I love those guys. Um, someday maybe if they ask me, I'd probably be down. Um, Redshift is not production ready? Question mark. No, absolutely, it's production ready. Absolutely, I would say that. Um, uh, none of the things that I mentioned would mean that it's not production ready. Uh, it's it's fairly new. It's only been around in cinema for a year. So there's going to be there's going to be problems like any new piece of software they're still working out the kinks. So I think it's production ready. I have run into issues where I've had to switch from using Redshift to Arnold because something was bugged out, but I usually am pretty good about letting them know what's going on and they're usually pretty good about fixing it. So yeah. Uh do I think Redshift is good for ArcViz? ArcViz absolutely. In fact, I it's my most recommended renderer for people doing ArcViz because it is so fast at it and you can bake your GI solutions the way V-Ray can. So you could actually bake your entire Irradiance cache um into a file and it'll render ridiculously fast. So ArcViz yes, for sure. Um mm -mm. Can you split the channels up in Fusion without that script? Yes, it just takes time. Um, it's just, it, we made the script back when, Tim used to work for me back at DK, and so we made the script because we got tired of hand doing it all the time. It just was such a pain, but yes, you can do it by hand. Uh, mm -mm. All right. Uh, would I ever take on virtual mentor? Wait, would you ever take on virtual mentors to learn LookBiz? Mentor ease, uh, maybe? Or mentees, students as mentor. Uh, yeah, I probably I might do that. That might be fun. Um, I would actually like to do more look dev uh instruction. I just haven't had the time to figure out how to make that happen. Um, but yeah, that's actually a good idea. Maybe maybe I'll talk to Nick about that. We need to think of some some way to make that happen. Okay, so I think that's gonna wrap it up. Uh, I'll take one more question. So edit uh wants to know what's the biggest between different. What's the biggest difference with Octane? Uh, th there's a lot of differences between Redshift and Octane. I would say that Octane is a unbiased renderer, meaning that it's a, it tries to uh, simulate reality as close as it can, which often means that it needs more samples and more time and that sort of thing. Whereas Redshift is kind of an unapologetic, biased frame renderer, which when I say unapologetic, I mean that it is just a like, I'm going to crank out these frames and get them done and it uh they both are gi or sorry they both work off the gpu uh but i would say redshift is a more of a production renderer something that you're going to do a lot of animation using or arcviz type of things not to say that you can't do that in octane you can but 
Uh, there's a lot way, more ways to cheat and to kind of cut corners in Redshift, which is what production is really all about, in my opinion. Um, okay, do, do, do. Uh, is there some way of pulling out a polygon selection to AOV like object ID? Oh, that reminds me. Thank you for that question. Um, I think I might need to do a part two of this because that just reminded me of a completely other AOV workflow that I think you guys would really dig. Uh, but I'll save that. I'm going to keep that a secret, save it for the next one. Uh, Mike, you made it, but I'm wrapping up. Um, but good news is, as soon as I'm done here, we edit it down. It'll be back up on YouTube. And uh, so, yeah, it'll be there for when you guys have time to watch it. So with that, I'm going to wrap things up. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Um, it's always fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got something out of it. Give me a thumbs up if you liked it. Um, obviously subscribe if you haven't. And uh, we'll see you on the next stream. You can check out all the stream schedule on grayscalegorilla.com slash live and see what we're up to. We're trying to stream a lot more. Uh, so get, get in the know and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye everybody.